uh, the question is, or the motion before us rather, is I'd rather be a roundhead than a cavalier. Uh, and these terms, as you know, roundhead and cavalier, were applied to the opposing sides in the English Civil War, which tore this country apart uh, between 1642 and 1649. Uh, the a person perhaps rarely quoted in these gatherings, but not forgotten, Michael Foote, uh, a previous and some would say equally unpopular leader of the Labour Party, uh, famously said, the only thing I want to know about a man is which side he would like his ancestors to have fought on at Marston Moor. Uh, it's extraordinary to think that the dividing lines of a war fought some 370 years ago uh, could still be used to define uh, who we are in F Michael Foote's day, but even today as well. I thought it would be useful, <coughs> before we hear our uh, two speakers, to just uh, give a little bit of the background information so they can plunge right away into the, uh, the arguments. Uh, the Civil War or Civil Wars, or as historians, uh, I'm told, prefer to refer to them these days as the War of Three Kingdoms, and we may hear an explanation of that term, uh, were caused by a complex uh, mix of political and economic and religious and social factors. Many of them had been brewing uh, right through the earlier part of the 17th century in England. Uh, but it crystallized with the struggle for power between King Charles I and Parliament, which eventually came to a head when uh, Charles raised his royal standard in Nottingham. Uh, that conflict ended with the defeat of Charles and famously his execution in 1649. That led to the formation of the Commonwealth and Oliver Cromwell, leader of the parliamentarians, uh, became and rejoiced in the title of Lord Protector. After Cromwell's death and the brief rule of his son, the monarchy was restored in 1660 with the accession of Charles II uh, to the throne. I know, of course, you're all familiar with that. Uh, that was purely to bring up the one or two people here who are not steeped uh, in English 17th century history up to speed, and I think we've done that. So who were the two sides in this conflict? On the one side, the king... Uh, mostly supported by aristocratic families, older, more established families, Catholics, and by people in uh, the north and west of England. And on the other hand, Parliament supported uh, largely in the south and southeast, uh, also backed by Puritans and religious independents who had been uh, offended and inflamed by Charles's attempts to uh, impose religious uniformity across the land. Uh, each side then would give, and this is often how the names uh, stick would give insulting nicknames, pejorative names to their opponents. So the parliamentarians called the royalist cavaliers, a term derived from the Spanish term caballeros, meaning armed troopers or horsemen, and the royalists called the parliamentarians roundheads, uh, a reference to the shaved heads uh, of the London apprentices who were active on the Parliament side before the fighting began. So there was uh, obviously uh, an element of mockery and stereotyping going on with these terms. But the key stereotype in each case was that Parliament saw the Royalists or Cavaliers as louche and dissolute and flamboyant, while the Royalists saw the Parliamentarians, the Roundheads, as uncouth, uh, ill-dressed and sort of uh, infradic, low-born. So tonight we're going to look and drill down into those stereotypes, see whether uh, they were real, whether they were fairly applied then, uh, but also, and I think this is the uh, spice in our conversation, why it is that those terms might still resonate today and to what extent the country we live in in 2014 still divides on roundhead or cavalier lines. Now, to uh, debate this, we have two uh, great speakers. Um, both of them are, and I warn you here, going to Ed Miliband it this evening, uh, by which I don't mean they're going to forget the large and central chunk of their argument. Um, <laughs> They are going to instead dispense with the podium and just uh, present themselves informally to you. Uh, our first speaker tonight, let's get straight to this, arguing for the case of the Roundheads, is a historian whose books include Blenheim, The Battle for Europe, and Prince Rupert, The Last Cavalier. His latest book, widely acclaimed, is The Killers of the King, The Men Who Dared to Execute Charles I, which tells the stories of the men who signed Charles I's death warrant which is interesting given uh, tonight that he's uh, defending the parliamentary cause because his forebear, Henry Spencer, the first Earl of Sunderland, was a royalist in the Civil War. Uh, I don't mean to intimidate his opponent when I point out that he is also included in volumes that collect the great speeches of the 20th century and of other centuries, in fact. Uh, usually he appears at the end of the volume 
for the eulogy he gave famously for his sister, Diana, Princess of Wales. So our first speaker, please a warm welcome for Charles Spencer. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I should say this is the first debate I've been party to since 1982, when at Eton I took on Boris Johnson over the existence of Father Christmas. <laughs> and uh, rather remarkably, I won, but I think Boris helped me with my case by not having prepared for one second. <laughs> Surprising. Uh, as I was waiting to come into this cockpit this evening, uh, I was making polite conversation downstairs, and I said, so why is it shaped like this? And they said, oh, no, that's so they could see bodies being carved up in the olden days and see the dissections. So I'm feeling very small and slightly exposed tonight. I'm going to cut straight to the nub of my argument and then build up round it and bring you personalities who I think will support my cause. Uh, I think if we go really to the nub of the issue of the roundhead cavalier debate, it is whether you honestly believe that the divine right of kings allows a man who's head of a state to act as he want, believing that he's only answerable to God? Or do you believe in the right of parliament and the people who elect those people to parliament to have their voice heard and to curtail the actions of a man or woman with a crown on their head? And that's really where this comes down to. And the fact is I'm going to broaden the debate to where its full meaning comes into focus, and that is that this argument, yes, it does have its ramifications today, but it's really about Charles I and Charles II and their rules. So we're talking really, the, the, I suppose the focus is from 1625, when Charles took over the crown, to 1685, when Charles II died. And I think I have to just lay it out there that neither man was very impressive individual. And I'm going to start with Charles I. I think on a human basis, he was perfectly admirable in certain areas. He was a very good husband until he took his mistress towards the end of his life. He was a very good father. He was a, 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 a patron of the arts, a great patron of Rubens and Van Dyck, and, and a great, he had a real appreciation for those fine things. But he was never meant to lead, so I think that's his get-out clause. He was the second son. He had an elder brother who took an unwise dip in the Thames and died. So this is a man who's much better suited, not as king, but as somebody who enjoyed his real pleasures, reading the Bible, playing chess. He was very good at lawn bowls, but leader at a time when this country needed leadership more than it ever had. He was an absolute disaster. And yet, how come he led an army into war against his own people? Well, I see that as the definition of a bankruptcy of leadership. The fact that this man not only raised his standard at Nottingham, calling his troops to come and support him, uh, and in fact, in a moment of great significance, the banner blew down that night. Uh, in a superstitious age, this mattered a lot. But here he was whipping up an army to fight against his own people. Now, the people who went to fight him, these roundheads who were so despised and looked down upon uh, by the Cavaliers, these tended to be people, a lot of them from the southeast and uh, uh, the London areas and, and the East Anglia, people who had strong leaders of their own and who wanted to make a stand against what they had seen as a very long period of royal abuse of power. From the late 1620s till 1640, Charles chose to rule without Parliament, and to do this, to fund himself, without the money, that, the revenue that Parliament would have given him, he had to resort to really shameful abuses of medieval powers that the kings had had. And it was only because, through his own, I suppose, prejudice in terms of religions, he whipped up the Scots to rise against him and to invade England, that he had to raise armies and had to call Parliament. So this is a man who's not worried about bringing warfare and bloodshed upon his own people. He lost the first civil war, a series of uh, stunning defeats towards the end, uh, reduced the military force of the royalists to nothing. And then you enter this stage where Charles was taken basically prisoner, but prisoner not as you and I would recognize it. He was treated with great care. Nobody knew what to do with a defeated king. 
and he shuttled around various palaces, including Hampton Court, until he made a break for it. And being uh, not aware of the, the safest place to go, which would have been the, com for the continent, he ended up on the Isle of Wight. And there, he did his real, real mistake. And this is where I think even those who would have a notional uh, and gut reaction to loyalty towards the crown must let him go. He went against all of the public pronouncements he was making about peace, and he fostered the second civil war. And this is his big sin in my eye. It's one thing to lose the first civil war, but to secretly whip up a second one, which caused unnecessary and, and quite severe bloodshed in the spring and summer of 1648. This is the arrogance of a man who was, as we know from his baggage train at Naseby, prepared to bring in foreign Catholic forces to try and prop up his kingship against his own people. This is where he becomes a traitor. And this is where they were justified in trying him for his life. And I believe, although the, the actual court that was constructed to try him in January 1649 was totally flawed, there was an absolute right of those who accused him to tell him that he was a traitor. He was, as the Puritans among the judges said, that man of blood. This was a little snippet from a verse in the book of Numbers which said, that man of blood who brings bloodshed upon his kingdom must die. So Charles was duly dispatched. And then we get the decade uh, of, uh, well, 11 years, in fact, of, I suppose, roundhead rule, which is mainly Cromwell's time. And Cromwell's, of course, a hugely divisive figure. Only in England could a man who chops off the head of a king and then kicks out Parliament have a statue outside the House of Commons. <laughs> but he was a great man as well as a flawed man. And I think one of the signs of greatness is how you act in triumph. And it would have been totally understandable by Machiavellian terms for Cromwell to have got stuck into the remaining royalists and maybe executed a few to make sure that if everything went wrong on the roundhead side, there weren't ready people ready to jump up and take the royalist cause again. And people advised Cromwell to take this harsh attitude. But no, he refused to do it. He thought it wrong, and he didn't do it at all. And of course, this left his legacy vulnerable. He left as his heir his son Richard as Lord Protector. And I have to say, Richard has had a very bad rap of it from the, uh, from the historians over the years. But in fact, he was a perfectly decent man. He realized he wasn't up to the job. He stepped aside. And it's only because of the chaos that happened after this that Charles II came back. He had no right to come here. He hadn't done some wonderful thing abroad to make him this great talisman that we needed to have here. He just happened to be born the eldest son of Charles I, and this country was in chaos, so we went to the default of monarchy. So Charles II came back among this wave of royalist euphoria, people tripping over themselves to forget that they had actually fought for Parliament, and they pointed their fingers at the regicides and let them be the scapegoats, the 80 men, the survivors of the 80 men who had somehow either signed the death warrant or, or pursued the king in court or on the scaffold. But Charles II soon showed his true worth. This was a man who, before this, had revealed himself to have no sense of loyalty. The Duke of Montrose was the great royalist standard bearer in Scotland, and in 1644, 1645, had delivered six incredibly rare royalist victories. But in the 1650s, Charles II, as Prince of Wales, double dealt him and left him to be taken by the enemy. And he was taken by, in chains through the streets of Edinburgh, uh, he wasn't allowed to defend himself from the missiles raining in at him, and he was beheaded and his four quarters dispatched. But this was a family tradition, because Charles I had done the same to the Earl of Strafford. Strafford had risked everything to support the king, and the king wrote to him and said that he would guarantee his honor, his fortune, and his life. Well, he failed on the third one, and Strafford unbelievably was sent for his dispatch. So I think at this point, I would like to say that if you're going to be loyal to a cause, loyalty has to be a two-way street. And you're offering your loyalty to two men who have no concept of it for themselves. Even on the day that Stratford was going for his execution, Charles I had the gall to say that he was feeling worse than Stratford must do. <laughs> this is an incredibly self-absorbed dynasty. The Stuarts 
I think, have this cataclysmic record of not being very good at being kings and not worthy of loyalty. And if you look at their legacy, if you look way back to Mary, Queen of Scots, executed, James I failed in his fundamental duty as a Protestant king in Europe to go to the rescue of his own daughter who had married the Elector Palatine and had her kingdom taken away by Catholics. And it was Parliament who was the, the force that wanted England to go to war to save a Protestant dynasty. And James would have nothing to do with it because it was too expensive. And then you have Charles I and Charles II and then James II, who's just outside the period I'm encapsulating tonight, but was an utter disaster. And after three years, was exiled and expelled and became an embarrassment to the French living off them. So all in all, we're looking at a family who are asking you to believe that they have a God-given right to your loyalty, but they have no concept of loyalty to those who risk everything for them. And it's on that basis that I think anyone who votes for them is really doing so at their peril. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfectly to time. Each of our speakers have got 12 minutes. If by any chance our second speaker uh, is overshooting, you may hear me pinging the glass. Uh, that's the polite warning of time rather than uh, a demand for Bordeaux or B B Burgundy to be brought to me. Um, but uh, we didn't need to do that then. Our next uh, speaker, making the case for, the, for those uh, cavaliers we just heard denounced as self-absorbed and undeserving of loyalty, is the reader in early modern history at Royal Holloway, University of London. Uh, she regularly appears uh, in the broadcast media and elsewhere to talk about uh, monarchy as well as the political and social history of these islands. She is the author of Elizabeth's Bedfellows, an intimate history of the Queen's Court, and of Mary Tudor, England's first queen. Uh, here to make the case for the Cavaliers, a warm welcome for Anna Whitelock. Thank you very much. I'm not going to quite miliband it, just in case I uh, forget some key points. Um, first of all, Charles Spencer, undoubtedly a great storyteller. However, I'm going to add a few facts and nuances to his argument. Charles Spencer and his supporters can argue, perhaps, that to be a roundhead was to be a defender of freedom, the fundamental rights of man and popular sovereignty. He can, and he did, point to the climatic years of the late 1640s, uh, which saw the Roundheads challenge, defeat, and, of course, ultimately execute Charles I, the absolutist tyrant, as they would have it. As such, uh, I have problems because we've got a nice and a nasty Charles, or, you know, two Charleses. Uh, so Charles Spencer, uh, of course, can then argue that uh, with uh, the Civil War, we see the end of uh, what he's described as ridiculous concepts of medieval kingship and the birth of uh, the constitutional rule that we take for granted today. Now, I want to sort of take apart some of those arguments, or at least challenge them a little bit. I will argue that uh, Charles Spencer's support for the Roundhead, and indeed his uh, claims for their achievement, misrepresents their cause as it developed during and immediately after the Civil War. I will point to the reality of life under the Roundheads during the 1650s and ask whether this was the kind of country you would have wanted to have lived in. We will look at the actions of the archetypal and much praised uh, by Charles Spencer Roundhead, Oliver Cromwell. Has his achievement been overstated? Should the Roundheads get the plaudits that Charles claims they deserve? I will also question how decisive and significant the Civil War actually was in the journey towards constitutional rule. The victory of the Roundheads was, after all, emphatically reversed with the restoration of Charles II in 1660. And one only needs to look, for example, to the 1680s, when the Crown humbled Parliament to argue that the Roundheads did not inevitably set a course towards constitutional monarchy. 
We also need to move beyond these stereotypical images of round heads and cavaliers. As Jonathan said, they were born as terms of polemic and abuse. Um, but in deciding your position today in this debate, it's important to realize that this is not simply a choice between a monarchy or republic. When we think of round heads and cavaliers, we're thinking more than that. We're thinking about an attitude to life, a lifestyle, a temperament, an ideal, and it crosses class lines. Pleasure, passion, joy de vivre, or self-control, self-denial, and a dour lack of humor. Such is the stark choice. <laughs> now, in reality, of course, we need both. But it's what you would prefer to be made of the most, if I can put it like that, that this debate is about. But first, let us deal with the 17th century context. What was it to be a roundhead or a cavalier? Can we look back and make a choice? Well, it's not an easy question. Everybody has an impression and mental image of the cavaliers, gorgeously dressed supporters of Charles I. And of course, we have Van Dyck uh, to thank for much of that. The popular impression has much to do uh, with a cavalier's clothes and his Charles Spaniels, as it does with his politics. And it's long been a tendency to dismiss uh, the Cavaliers in the, the words of Seller and Yateman in their 1066 and all that, as wrong but romantic, as the unthinking, unyielding defenders of an absolutist monarch in the face of those who asserted the supremacy of Parliament. But actually, and this is a crucial point that I would first take issue uh, with uh, nice Charles here, was that actually the terms are much more complicated. It's not simply about for and against divine right monarchy. Matters of religion, of politics, geography, gender, family, self-interest, all of these played a part in people's decisions about which sides to take in the civil war. Broadly speaking, yes, those who fought for the king uh, were high Anglicans and Catholics, but there were, there were also some moderate Puritans. There were men and women, and they were not simply defenders of a moribund status quo. Royalism was full of vitality, cultural vibrancy, and intellectual creativity. Perhaps the archetypal cavalier was the king's nephew, Prince Rupert, who was put in charge of the cavalry. He was tall, strikingly handsome, and a brilliant leader. He's often remembered today as little more than being an impulsive cavalry man, brightly clad and galloping at the head of the royalist forces. But actually, that does very uh, scarce justice to the whole of the man. When his participation in the Civil War ended, Rupert was only 26 years old and went on to have an active life as a soldier, a sportsman, a scientist and artist. Indeed, our very own uh, Charles Spencer has written an excellent book on Prince Rupert, the last cavalier, and he himself has acknowledged uh, Prince Rupert's appeal. In this fantastic book of Charles, <laughs> the, pr the prince is portrayed as impetuous and imperious, but also courageous and industrious, a man interested not only in the art of war on land and on sea, but also an amateur scientist who invented new arguments and explosives, uh, sorry, new armaments and explosives, an artist and a founded member of Charles II's Royal Society. There was more to him than his handsome looks and his spaniel, wasn't there, Charles? <laughs> Another great cavalier, of course, was William Cavendish, Marcus, and later Duke of Newcastle. In many cases, he perfectly matches the kind of stereotypical image of the cavaliers. Uh, but again, there's more to him than this. Beyond his enthusiasm for fencing and horse riding, he was an important patron of the arts, in particular Ben Jonson. He wrote verse and prose himself. And together with his brother, he was at the forefront of the new philosophy in England, promoting theoretical research, practical experiments in optics, mathematics, mechanics. And when he was in exile, he continued his philosophical and scientific researches, drawing uh, Descartes and Hobbes into his uh, circle. He patronized many of the leading exponents in the fields of literature, art, music, and science. And he must be acknowledged for this. He also married whilst he was in exile. And his wife, uh, who, better known as Margaret Cavendish, was 
also a figure uh, to, much to be recommended. She was a feminist in many ways, ahead of her time, the first woman in Britain to publish books in her own name, including a biography of her husband. So I think we can agree that we can dismiss the cavalier stereotype of style over substance. Uh, I could go on, I could point to William Davenant, I could point to uh, Edward Hyde, who wrote a, a history of uh, the English, I could go on. I, not to least to mention, of course, cavalier poets who wrote about sensual love and the importance of enjoying life and living in the moment. So from this distance, it's perhaps impossible to say where, the, where you would have been in the 17th century, a cavalier or a roundhead. So many factors were at stake. And in fact, again, to add a slightly more nuanced position to the debate, many people were initially reluctant to commit themselves to one side or another. People saw themselves as being both for the king and for parliament, and were then only as the war developed forced to take sides. And what of the roundheads? Did they prove to be the champions of popular sovereignty and liberty? Would you have liked to live under roundhead rule? The Roundheads were against the monarchy and in support of Parliament. We know that. But actually, what's central to their uh, belief was religion, the centrality of religion. And we need to put that at very much at the heart of our debate. And when we're talking about the Roundheads here, we're not simply talking about a desire for simple worship in the face of Charles' um, more, ornate, uh, more ornate worship and equal access to the scriptures. We we're actually talking about their core belief being predestination in the divine election for salvation of a chosen few. And it was this, in fact, that galvanized their opposition to church and king. Far from the Puritans being egalitarians or proto-democrats, this was about the most elitist worldview imaginable. Not to mention one that tended towards a strident paternalism and knowing what's best for the unsaved and unwashed. And we also can see division in roundhead ranks. After the establishment of the Commonwealth, the group of thinkers known as the Levellers soon clashed with the newly appointed Council of State. Key Leveller leaders were imprisoned. Moreover, many of the tens of thousands of women who fought on the side of the roundheads were equally disappointed. When thousands signed a petition for equal rights and delivered it to Parliament, they received short shrift. They were told by Cromwell's parliamentarians to go home and wash the dishes. Pretty much words to that effect. When we're talking about Cromwell and loyalty, I think we need to think in very different terms than perhaps uh, our nice Charles here would suggest. What resulted after the execution of the king was not the visionary Commonwealth that many held out hope for. In the end, it seemed more like a military coup than a democratic revolution. England became a religious republic, an armed camp, an occupied country in all but name, where law might easily be delivered at the point of a sword, as in the magistrate's court. Along with this massive security campaign was this drive to puritanize the land. The Church of England was destroyed. Uh, bishop, priests, chaplains, school teachers were ordered to leave their posts. The universities were purged. All joy was removed from daily life. Christmas, for goodness sake, was to be banned. Even on a Sunday, no longer could you do horse riding or knitting. Cromwell, we need to consider very carefully. He, he displayed a colossal self-righteousness, a coarse intolerance uh, and for bullying. He was no proto-democrat. He, of course, perpetuated in Ireland, not least, infamous atrocities which dominated uh, that period. And his appalling cruelty is acknowledged right to this day. And of course, in 1653, this great champion defender of uh, parliament dissolved the parliament. And in doing so, he undid, at a stroke, the entire legitimacy of the war, which he'd fought against the king's own unparliamentary principles. The Republic failed. Have I got one minute? I haven't pinged yet. Oh, I haven't pinned. Oh, good. You've got at least 90 seconds. Oh, brilliant. The Republic failed. In 1660, there was a widespread desire to establish the relationship between Crown and Parliament. And with the restoration of Charles II, the exploits of the parliamentarians were emphatically reversed. 
So much that in 1700, the poet laureate John Dryden could write, thy wars brought nothing about. Indeed, it might be argued that the most important effect of the regicide and Cromwell's protectorate was to induce, as one historian has described, an enduring mistrust of radical institutional change in England. If Charles I had not been executed, it might be asked, would we still have a monarchy now? But what about the terms roundhead or cavalier today? And this is really where the heart of tonight's debate lies. These terms survive regardless of the 17th century conflict and have come to describe different uh, and opposing types or archetypes in British national character. And just as in the 1640s, it's not simply a question of class or money, left or right, but it's one of taste and temperament. On the one side, we have flamboyance, the love of fun, a scorn for rules, a sense of irony. On the other side, we have those marked by earnestness, discipline in life and work, an iron will to give up pleasure, always ready to be outraged or indignant, ready to wave a finger of disapproval, and not naturally given to irony. And some people might say, isn't that basically American culture? Well, in many ways... <laughs> In many ways, that's true. Many uh, of the English revolutionaries were exported there at the Restoration. Cavaliers instead rely on flamboyant connections. They rely on the big picture, big gestures, taking risks, seizing the day. They believe in self-sacrifice if the cause motivates them. They celebrate the court's cult of the amateur. It's about taking part, not necessarily winning. Now, in their commitment to hard work and moral probity, of course, the roundheads are to be admired. They've made a considerable contribution to Britain today. They've set up bureaucracy and systems with a bowler-hatted professionalism. But are we now not increasingly aware of the dangers and the downside of roundhead Britain? An encroaching sense of the nanny state, of being told what we can and cannot do. There's growing resistance to the intrusion of the state to health and safety regulations, big brother surveillance cameras in our life. Yes, we've achieved, thank you, roundheads, but at what cost? Society is now suffering from a burnout, an inability to get off life's treadmill, a sense that there's more to life than work, but not knowing how to change. We all want a bit more cavalier influence in our lives. We all want more food, more good company, and an appreciation of the better things. We can also, I think, see cavalier and roundhead types among politicians. I'm sure we recognize roundhead ones, rather humorless, puritanical, dour, more focused on winning and being more politically correct than inciting the passions. You know the type of people. It doesn't make you want to stay watching Question Time. They are the politicians who conform to professional party machines, who follow the diktats of party officials or spin doctors. Cavalier politicians, on the other hand, stand out for their irreverence, their passions, their determination not to be politically correct. One might herald Tony Benn as a figure. Might, one might even point to Boris Johnson. You don't have to agree with his politics to acknowledge his flamboyance and his ability to liven up a debate. Surely Winston Churchill, with his cigar-smoking love of rogues, his relentless passion, his charm and wit, heralded by many as the greatest Britons, was the ultimate cavalier. Nowadays, surely we want more cavalier politicians. There's too many clones, too many risk-averse carbon copy MPs who have few core convictions for which they are prepared to live and die for. Political disaffection and disengagement is surely a consequence. Oh, what Ed Miliband would do for some cavalier charisma. And so, to return to the motion, ladies and gentlemen, life is short, life is precious, we should celebrate it and enjoy its riches and live in the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, do I look like a roundhead? <laughs> I urge you to reject the motion and support me in saying I would rather be a cavalier than a roundhead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tremendously spirited speeches from them both. I'm going to give you the results of uh, the vote you uh, took part in as you came in here. This was before you'd been moved and stirred and your passions roused by these two speeches. Uh, this was the sort of indicative vote before you came in, or as you came in, but before you'd heard. 
So those opting before the debate to be and um, to identify uh, with the roundheads were 33 percent. Uh, those identifying as Cavaliers, 38 percent. Cavaliers with the advantage. Uh, and don't knows a whopping 29 percent when you came in, uh, sitting on the fence. Um, but we'll see how those numbers stack up now that you've heard the speeches and, and with what you're going to hear uh, later on. Well, inspired um, by Anna's uh, definitions there <coughs> of uh, these two types, the passion and pleasure uh, of uh, the Cavaliers set against the self-discipline and uh, humour bypass of the Roundheads, <coughs> as you defined it, I just thought we would do something. I hadn't planned this, but it just uh, inspiration came to me. A, a sort of quick fire round with the two of you. I'm going to throw out a few names, and I want to see if you agree on, just at least if we can agree on our terms here. <laughs> Um, it's partly because you said Tony Benn, who I would have down as a roundhead, you Definitely, see. Definitely, he's uh, mine. Okay, you do. <laughs> uh, very good. And, uh, but you claim Boris Johnson and Winston Churchill. Are you going to argue with those two? Well, Boris, you... uh, well, Winston Churchill will go either side, as we know from his record. He did cross the floor. Boris, I won't give you because <gasps> there was a famous regicide who was Boris Johnson. Uh, he was a womanizing, brilliant minded, uh, legally uh, fantastic man who used to people used to pack in to hear him, called Henry Martin. And he was a regicide who got off the death sentence because he was so charming and so brilliant at speaking, and he was allowed to go and have a life sentence in Chepstow Castle with his mistress. <laughs> I think Boris could do that. But he hasn't as yet. We don't want to avoid libel. Yes. Yeah. I, I like the presumption that he would be facing a death sentence were it not for his charm. Um, <laughs> now, let, so quick fire round. I'm just going to throw a name and I want to hear both of you in a word. David Cameron, roundhead or cavalier? You can have him. Roundhead. No, I don't. <laughs> roundhead, you think? Yeah, I think no, more. Uh, well, roundhead, but he'd he's be trying so to manufacture insulted. some cavalier charisma. I think he sees himself as a, as a cavalier, and that, that it would be unfair to disillusion him. Okay, I want. I, <laughs> I want us to get so agreed on our definitions that we come to some yeah. convergence. George Osborne, roundhead or cavalier? Roundhead. I'm afraid so. Roundhead, yeah. <laughs> Very good. I knew we'd get agreement. Um, Margaret Thatcher, roundhead or cavalier? I, I think roundhead, actually. Ra yeah, roundhead. Roundhead, good, yeah. they agree. Ed Miliband? You want to say I think he is. He's I think the he worst sort of roundhead, but we'll... Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, think we're I have don't want him to be seen as representative. I think <laughs> there's going to be agreement on this one. Nigel Farage. Cavalier. Yeah, he's definitely a cavalier. Cavalier. Yeah. Wildcard here, Alex Salmond. Mmm, hard one. Began as a roundhead, become a little bit of a cavalier. Well, there was a third <laughs> section. They were called the club men who sort of hated everyone. I, I'd, put him <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd put him there. Okay. I think we're going to get consensus on this one. Russell Brand. Why do we give him space? I Cavalier. Think... <laughs> <laughs> Haircut he... alone, surely. Well, he looks like a Cavalier, but I think if you scratch underneath him, not that I want to, um, <laughs> you, you would find Roundhead because he's pretty anti, anti the rule of law, isn't he? OK, very good. I had two more which I was just going to throw at you. One of them is not a person, but we'll see what you think of this. Uh, but the one who is a person, Grayson Perry, roundhead or cavalier? Cavalier. Yes. Yeah, yep. good. And my last one is Twitter, roundhead or cavalier? Gosh, interesting. Uh, I think it's made up of both roundheads and cavaliers. So when you I can't see Charles the first managing Twitter, so I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I think we're looking at more progressive types. Well, I think Twitter's definitely a roundhead I thing. thought so. When you said it was lacking in humour, no irony, and constantly earnest and wagging its finger in the manner of a nanny state, I thought Twitter. Um, <laughs> so I, I thought, I thought unfair stereotypes myself. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. Well, you've heard the arguments. I'm going to start with you, Charles Spencer, because yes. you heard the argument there that was put very trenchantly that... Um, we shouldn't identify with roundheads because they were joyless. Uh, they uh, had uh, a terrible record in Ireland, the atrocities in Ireland under, Thomas, uh, under Oliver Cromwell, purging of the universities, even, although some might count this in their favour, even banning knitting on a Sunday. Um, <laughs> I thought that put them in the roundhead camp a bit. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the, this pretty grim and bleak record, uh, with even when you uh, take out those sort of cultural things about the sense of self-denial and the humourlessness, there's actually a historical record as well, which is pretty grim. Well... If I can start with the Irish thing, because that's the one I'm most familiar with. Yes, 
it was, it was a, a horrendous thing that the New Model Army did in Ireland. Um, there was a lot of bloodshed among civilians. But if you know that the rules of law uh, of, in terms of warfare at this time in Europe, uh, it was very much that you warned a city to surrender. And if they didn't surrender, they knew the consequences because they were absolutely understood. Everyone would suffer if you were taken. And the thing is, particularly in Ireland, the conditions were so terrible. They had to draw lots to get regiments to go there. Uh, they had little boys go and pick little straws out, and the regiments had to go because nobody wanted to go there because of malaria and all the other terrible diseases that were there. So if you put an army to the huge inconvenience and loss of life of sitting and besieging somewhere, then you suffered the consequences. So of course, we can sit here today and say that was appalling. This was entirely normal in Europe, and everybody knew the rules. And going on to the humorless bit, yes, I, I mean, and the, the church bit and all of that. Well, how accepting a church was the one under the Stuarts that forced all those people across the Atlantic to go and settle in America and start again because it was so repressive here? And what about uh, the, the, whole, the whole feeling that everything was monitored by the established church? This was a time of enormous superstition, and people had to find their way forward. And to give the Roundheads credit, Puritan, they were trying to find the pure roots of Christianity. And I'm not saying they always found it, but that's a noble mission in my belief. And then if you go back to the, the general humorless and culture, well, Anna threw some rather third-rate sort of playwrights towards us, which we, I'm not sure she could name, and I certainly can't. But let's think of the great writers on the Roundhead side, headed up by Milton. Milton was in a debate in this very forum as being one of the two great. Who was greater, Shakespeare or Milton? This is the great spokesman for culture uh, among the Puritans. And then I have to say, just very briefly, because I know I'm hogging it, but the people that Anna chose as these epitome of wonderful royalists, well, absolute rubbish. Prince Rupert, <laughs> Prince Rupert was a significantly talented man across the board. But, going back to my earlier point, he was kicked out despite devoting his life to helping his uncle, King Charles I. Charles I stripped him of all his offices and pushed him away because he lost Bristol, a city that was impossible to hold uh, in, in the circumstances. And Cavendish was the worst sort of cavalier. He is the one I should have thought of myself <laughs> because he lost the Battle of Marston Moor because he had a hissy fit with one of his generals and was busy smoking a pipe in a carriage when, the, when he was attacked. And they had no commander at M Marston Moor and that was why they lost. And then Edward Hyde, she mentioned. Well, I'm sure Hyde would be thrilled to be brought in as a supporter for the Cavalier cause because Charles II exiled him. He had been the most loyal Lord Chancellor this country had ever had, and his reward was to be kicked out in 1667 because a bunch of cavaliers got together and undermined his position at court, made sure he was exiled, with the petty added punishment that even in exile his children weren't allowed to come and visit him, even though one of his children was married to James II, the future James II. So we're talking about, I have to say, extraordinary examples from the other side which only show the utter emptiness of their argument. So what about that? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Anna. Yeah. Anna, well, what, what about that, that you've picked up some flaky, uh, hissy-fit characters there? And, and also <laughs> the point that, yes, even you know, some, some uh, horrible things happened, but that was just how it was back then. Well, that is just nonsense. Um, and the point of picking out a few characters, I mean, the fact is... Charles was still evaluating them. them on... Yeah, but you were evaluating <laughs> them on whether or not they were successful as military figures. What I'm trying to say is, uh, is consider these people in the round, not simply as military figures, but actually, you know, a sense of... a greater sense of life, an appreciation of the riches of life, rather than simply being defined and evaluated for their success or otherwise as military figures. And the point is that both of these camps, the Roundheads and the Cavaliers, I mean, actually encompass a whole spectrum of different personalities and individuals. So, yeah, of course, within it, both camps, there's going to be flawed figures. That's, you know, the very nature of it. What we're trying to talk about here is we're talking about the stereo... Well, I suppose we're trying to move beyond the stereotypes, but we're trying to evaluate the kind of temperament, the mindset, the approach, the, the lifestyle uh, of a roundhead and a cavalier, rather than say, you know, do I agree with everything that Prince Rupert did or Charles, etc.? 
Um, so I think, you know, in a, in a way, that's not what the debate is about. The point about Ireland, you know, the fact that we can just say, you know, we'll never mind about a massacre, raping, pillaging, whatever, that's just how it was at the time, you know, is just mind-blowing. And I think that people from both sides, roundheads and cavaliers, and historians in the hundreds of years since, have always, you know, held Cromwell to account for those particular atrocities. So the idea that you can kind of dismiss that in a couple of sentences uh, is, is, is stunning. What's your view on, standing back, back a bit just from the antagonism between Roundhead and Cavalier, why it is that here we are, best part of 400 years later, still debating in these terms? And they are terms which have hung around, whereas a lot of you know, the pejorative language used about factions in other wars in other places have just long faded into history. Why is it that Roundhead and Cavalier continue as a sort of typology, as a kind of division that's useful for this country? Well, I think because I suppose there was unfinished business, the fact that the monarchy, you know, was restored. And I suppose in that sense, you know, it was, it was a, you know, a spirited, fundamentally sort of changing in lots of ways in terms of outlook and, you know, new ideas that began to spring up and circulate and so on. But at the same time, you know, the monarchy was restored. So there was a sense of, you know, not a full resolution. But I'm also, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this as part of this debate, I'm not sure that the terms roundhead and cavalier are in general common use. I mean, you know, I, I'll ask this to, you know, to the, a rhetorical question to the floor. I'm not sure that people would, first of all, instinctively say whether they would see themselves as a roundhead or a cavalier, let alone their friends, or whether they would think, oh, at work, that person's in a, a bit of a roundhead. I just don't think it, you know. I don't know where you work, but where I work, yes. <laughs> We've got a very upmarket crowd here. I'm sure they rarely think of anything else. Do, Ch um, what about you, Charles? The, you know, here we are, four centuries later. These terms are, are at least still understood. I mean, do you accept what Anna was saying there, that maybe it's because there was some unfinished business here? Yes, I, I think even if the terms aren't uh, in, in common currency, except in the Guardian's office, I, I think the, mm. the, the, the actual notion of whether you're cavalier or roundhead... But cavalier as, a, as an adjective is completely different to being a cavalier. I mean, cavalier has a sort of dash and a, 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 and a sort of uh, charm to it, which obviously wasn't part of the, the process back then. But I think that we... Uh, it's quite interesting the way... Um, Anna sort of drilled down into what she perceived uh, everyone to be. And, uh, and I'm not going to, to fight her on that, but it is still open to interpretation, the roundhead attitude or the cavalier. Uh, and, and I don't think we should... Uh, I, I agree with her, you can't generalise that everyone on either side in the Civil War uh, adhered to that stereotype. But I think this is a country that, if you look at it, for so long we've had predominantly two political parties, whether it was Whig or Tory or, or Labour and Conservative uh, at the helm. We are really a, a, a two-party state, although that's becoming uh, more blurred now. But uh, traditionally, that's what we've been. So it's easy to sort of see it in a, in a, in a very clear-cut uh, way. Let's, uh, in perhaps roundhead spirit of uh, proto-democracy, and imagine ourselves in the Putney debates, let's open this up and hear other voices. Uh, we've got people walking around, I hope, with microphones. There's one there, there's one there. And, although I'm a bit blinded, I think this, there's a microphone, a fixed microphone there. I'm going to take them in sort of groups of two and three. Any thoughts, contributions, questions, do keep them brief if you can. There's a first hand up here. Uh, and have we got someone in position? Well, why don't we pass the microphone to you so we've got at least two ready. Yeah, you go first. Can I just try and add a bit more nuance to what Anna was saying earlier about Oliver Cromwell, who was a deeply complex man, but he did enjoy practical jokes. He loved music. Uh, he said that when he was a youngster, he played football with a great, great, great delight. Um, he, when he lived at Hampton Court, he enjoyed the patronage of Milton, and you've already mentioned Milton, but also Ma Andrew Marvell, who was one of the great Puritan poets, and his poem, To His Coy Mistress, is all about carpe diem and you know, enjoying life and having a lovely time. So actually, I don't think I, don't think I accept your interpretation of Roundhead and Cavalier anyway. So. Maybe there's just a little bit of Cavalier in every Roundhead and a little bit of Roundhead yes, in exactly. every Cavalier. Um, well, who's got the microphone next? Somebody oh, should... Yes, you can. Yep. Uh, as uh, two retired... Sorry. Shall I ask a question? Yes, please, Sorry. yeah. I'm just as making sure the microphone is... As two retired members sitting here amongst a regiment of foot, I would argue that, um, that the, arrest, the triumphal restoration of Charles II answers the question. Uh, uh, you just explain a little bit more what you mean. And there's somebody there with the microphone, yeah. 
Just to unpack your... I was saying, positive. well, yeah. I would argue that the rest, triumphal restoration of King Charles II to the throne would yeah. answer the question. Oh, you mean because it means we're all cavaliers? Exactly. Really? I see. OK, thank you. Let's have a uh, gentleman there, yeah. Uh, I wanted to hear from the historians your view of 1689 and, in a sense, the... Do you see that as a vindication of the Roundheads or a vindication of the Cavaliers? It's, it's parliamentary sovereignty or, of a sort, but it's, but it's restoration of the monarchy and preservation of the monarchy. So, so ultimately, the constitution that we've inherited since then, is it a Cavalier or is it a Roundhead? OK. Well, why don't you pick up that and the contribution there that, uh, you know, the very fact that Charles II takes his place on the throne shows the argument was settled and it was settled in the Cavaliers' favour. I think what 1660 settled was the fact that this was a country that gravitated towards monarchy as a concept. And the fact that the experiment with republicanism from 1649 to 1660 was ultimately a failure. But it doesn't mean that it was a return of the Cavaliers. Charles II came back. He was a bankrupted fugitive living in Europe with no hope of coming back and no money. He came back because he was needed here as a tool of the state. And he came back on very reduced circumstances. He had to agree not to go for vengeance against anyone. And he had to, although he was allowed to have a, a tilt at the regicides, but not the 50% of the country that had stood against his family. So I think the real answer is 1689 or 1688, when the Glorious Revolution took place. And that was when it was the end of the Stuart uh, main line. James II was made into an exile because of all his excesses, his cavalier excesses, as I'd see them, uh, trampling across the, the rights of independent bodies such as Oxford University uh, and trying to impose Catholic officers on the army. And basically, I see this as the great triumph of the Roundhead uh, movement, that they managed not only to get rid of a totally unacceptable form of monarchy, but to replace it with the blueprint for what became over time, through lots of honing and lots of experimentation, the constitutional monarchy that's supported by over 80% of the country now. Thank you. Um, and what about you, Anna, at this point about uh, there's Cromwell, who actually had, on your definition, some quite cavalier traits, music, football, jokes, poetry, Marvel, all of that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with those things. And I think, you know, as you said, we're not saying that it's a, to be around he's to be 100% a roundhead and to be a, a cavalier is to be 100% a cavalier. It's, and, you know, when you decide which you'd rather be, it's more about that, you know, it's the majority of you, if you like, rather than you in your entirety. So, yes, Cromwell, absolutely. But the, the was, I mean, many of the things that you said were true. But that's not to say that, you know, what he was, the points in terms of uh, the supremacy of parliament, um, popular sovereignty and so on, those promises that he made in many cases. And, and I mean, Charles in the beginning talked about loyalty and the way in which uh, Charles I had kind of broken the trust and loyalty and, and people that had fought for him and what had he done, turned around and done. The same actually could be said of Cromwell. But I do agree with, um, with Charles and again with the gentleman up there about the significance of 1688 really more than uh, the Civil War and, and the Restoration. Um, you know, I think it's striking that even though Charles II was a weakened figure, you know, that the army and the navy, for example, remained in the hands of the king on his return. And there was an act in 1661 that said neither parliament nor the people uh, had any coercive power over the persons of the king of this realm. So parliament, you know, retreated quite significantly in 1660. I think, you know, I was reading today one of those sort of great and late historians, Kevin Sharp, who's, who's written these, a whole uh, three-volume work on, on monarchy and the uh, image of the monarchy over time through, from the Tudors to Stuarts and so on. You know, and he talks about how, you know, Charles II was, in a way, understood that the climate had changed and actually was, you know realised the need to engage more with, uh, with people and was able to have be both a sort of... There was a sort of common touch to him as well as being able to blend the sort of mystique of monarchy. And he points to, you know, various examples of Charles II himself, not simply kind of coming back in the same model of his father, but acknowledging times had changed. 
so again, you know, yes, we can say that, you know, in that sense, perhaps there was a roundhead achievement there in the way that it kind of tempered uh, Charles. We, it should also be said, that, of course, that the Church of England was rapidly restored uh, in 1660 uh, after the, the sort of Puritan uh, directory of worship and so on. So again, this was something that was, pe was desired by many. Thank you. Can we get the microphone to this chap here? Let's keep your hand up. Other people who've got, who want to get in, let's make sure we see your hands too. Uh, we've got somebody there at the back. And, uh, well, yeah, let's get the second microphone there after we've heard from you. Yeah. Um, c uh, c can I suggest that, in fact, um, neither side is wholly deserving of, of uh, admiration or support, uh, that, um, that Charles I was uh, totally unreasonable and had believed in divine right of kings, which was outdated and absurd and was self-serving in the first place. Uh, and he took that to an extreme, which necessarily resulted in a revolt. But then the roundhead side uh, was grim, puritanical, abolished plays as well as Christmas, um, that it was, uh, they ended up in chaos. And, but out of all the conflict between them, we ended up with a settlement in Britain, a constitutional settlement, which has lasted to this day we avoided the bloodshed of the French Revolution and many other revolutions throughout Europe, and that we were extremely fortunate in these conflict between these two unreasonable sides, um, and that the real heroes of the peace were those who made the compromise, and I'm not knowledgeable enough to know exactly who they were, but I'm, I'm thinking of people like Monk, and uh, people who were uh, the Pepys's patron, I forget his name, but people who made the compromise and actually established the order from which we've benefited down to this day. So we almost needed both and the clash between them to get where we are now. Who, who's got the microphone there? Yeah. I wanted to ask a question, and I'm American, so I want to say we take the best of both. But I wanted to address Charles' first premise that the Roundheads didn't believe in the divine right of the monarchy. And you didn't address that, Anna, so I was just wondering what you thought about it. Well, you're suggesting that the Roundheads did believe in that, are you? Is that no, what no, they, they did not believe in it, and you didn't address whether or not you believe that the monarchy had divine rights and could only, you know, speak to God, really. And oh, you want this Charles to ask, argue with it, or, or to explain no, whether no, he believes want, on divine right? No, Anna didn't respond to his main premise that the Roundheads didn't believe that the monarchy had Anna divine didn't respond, rights. I see. Sorry. So I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Okay, thank you. That's... Uh, Fine. And who else got the microphone next? I think this will be the third one of this round. Yeah. As it turned out, it was, it was one bad lot up against another bad lot. <laughs> but if we were unfortunate enough to be alive in the 1640s, it was not, as the motion rather makes it sound, a lifestyle choice. Would I rather be jolly and gay and <laughs> have a nice time, or am I a bit serious? It was a choice about the future of the country. And here was a king who believed in the divine right of kings, who was having his way with the country, as it were. And here were the taxpayers who said, enough is enough, old chum. Up with this, we will not put. This is not a proper, moral, and decent way to run this country of England. And that was the choice they were making, not a choice about how their friends would see them next time they met them. Thank you. Is there somebody up here who would like to get in? We've got that microphone up there. Is any any takers? No. In that case, let's um, we'll deal with these things. We'll, we'll, let's put those to you, first of all, uh, Anna Whitelock. This idea that, uh, well, first of all, how can you be on the other side of the roundheads, given that their defining principle was in opposition to the divine right of kings? Does that mean you're somehow uh, a believer in that divine right? And then the point you've just heard there, this wasn't about you know, personality type and sort of flair and uh, joie de vivre. This was a really straightforward argument about the constitutional principle. And one side believed in divine right and one side didn't. And your side, that you're defending, were on the wrong side of that argument. Well, it's unfortunate. I mean, I thought the gentleman at the back put it very well. But unfortunately, as it sort of broke down, it wasn't simply a choice between, you know, divine right or, or not. I mean, actually, within, you know, the roundhead um, camp, there was all kinds of debates and discussion about exactly what should replace the monarchy. So it wasn't simply a sort of yes or no question. You're absolutely right, though, that, you know, in a way, the question does suggest a sort of, you know, are we choosing, which lifestyle are we choosing? And actually, it was about the future of the country. But that wasn't something that was um, 
absolutely settled. I mean, although um, the Roundheads, you know, wanted to uh, get rid of the absolutist tendencies, the arbitrary rule of Charles, many weren't looking simply to get rid of the monarchy per se. And that's, you know, tr that's true on both sides. So it, it's much more nuanced than that. And I guess in some ways that answers the question of the, the, the lady too. Um, you know, it's not simply subscribing to, you know, um, a monarchy or not. Um, you could have a different position within that. And you know, it's also true to say that within the, 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 you know, the 1640s and 50s, people changed sides too. I mean, this was, these were very fluid debates that were going on. Um, such was the nature of the times. Do you want to say something, um, Charles Spencer, about the, uh, the questioner there, or the first speaker there, who said that actually you did need both, and it was the conflict mm -hmm. between them, out of which was forged the settlement that has endured in our country for more than three centuries, and a good thing too. And, uh, you know, by just making the case spiritedly for roundheads, you're missing the other half of that very necessary equation. Yes, I, I think that's a very intelligent point, and I think there's a lot of truth in it. But basically, I think where, where I uh, still push my point over your very good one, just, is the fact that the settlement that came out of it was essentially a roundhead one. Uh, that the days of the royalism of old, the cavalier view of royal, royalty and royal power had gone. So yes, there was uh, an inevitability. It wasn't, it wasn't just we needed this clash. It was going to happen if you got a very <coughs> obstinate king who listened to the last advisor who'd spoken to him, who surrounded himself with advisors, who even his right-hand man, Clarendon, said were a pretty poor bunch that he was going to be in opposition. So, yes, you needed something to be sorted out, but it needed somebody as unfortunate in leadership as Charles I to turn it into, and let's not forget this, the bloodiest war this country's ever had. I, you know, this is the key. It wasn't a minor scuffle. It wasn't just a few little skirmishes in the Midlands. This was an absolutely massive cause of bloodshed. And uh, we're remembering the First World War quite rightly, this centenary, but the loss of blood uh, in this country was even greater uh, per percentage of population because of the war that Charles I started by raising his banner. Can I, I just it's, uh, absolutely agree with that? You know, the amount of bloodshed and the way in which families and communities and villages were torn apart and decimated was, you know, incredible. And I think in many cases overlooked in the way in, in, in the sort of uh, curriculum at schools and stuff. I think this is a kind of relatively neglected area. I just wanted to pick up on one point where you said that the settlement was certainly a roundhead one. What settlement are you pointing to? Oh, I mean, I don't mean a settlement as in that there was one, but I suppose the, the 1688 Glorious Revolution was definitely a victory for the, the fundamental uh, tenets of, of the parliamentary cause. But, that, but then uh, there's also some blend of cavalier give and take in that. Th that's what I'm saying, but I'm saying the overriding... Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be so polite, and <laughs> but I mean, it's it's just that I think if you if you split it down the middle at the end of 1688, it's it's 80% uh, parliamentary settlement and 20% reconstituted royal settlement. All right, let's hear with two people uh, coming and waiting to come in with questions, and then what we're going to do is have summing up, and uh, there'll be another chance. So let's go with you first. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to question Charles Spencer's uh, view on King Charles himself. You gave this lovely sort of picture of Charles, which sets him out to be very disloyal, very loose, but, and, and you used the fact that he didn't help his sister as, a, as an example of that. But you sort of bent the facts slightly to fit your argument in the view of Charles you wanted to build up. He did actually send over troops to help his sister. In fact, he got involved in three conflicts between uh, 1625 uh, and 1629. And really, you, you've just bent those facts out to fit your argument. Can you really say that he was that disloyal? He did go and help his sister. Well, I didn't say, I didn't accuse him of that at all. I accused his father yeah, of not did. helping his daughter. And that is true. All right, let's hear from you and we'll let's... Um <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Let's hear from you, and then the other, uh, it's hard for me to see, but I know somebody else is waiting with a, with a question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm a little bit disappointed in the way the argument's gone, because I would have thought it's more about fundamental yeah. human rights and democracy. I mean, we're talking about the working classes 
against the ruling classes, as far as I see it. And, and no one's really addressed that. We're talking about uh, divine, rule by divine right or, or uh, right by birth against the people. And I'm not sure that... And, f and, and for your money, would the roundhead side were at the people... Yes, the side I mean, of obviously Cromwell people. and his record has, has kind of distorted that a little bit, and he, the way that he went about but it. But, but Cromwell dissolves the parliament. That's, you know, Cromwell dissolves the parliament and takes power essentially to himself and has all the regalia as a monarch. So, you Which know, is why he distorted it, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but, but it's very... Originally, originally, I would have joined the roundheads on the basis that they're fighting for... Uh, democracy and the but people. But that's not how it was understood at the time. People didn't simply go, right, I'm fighting for democracy, I'm going to sign up and be a roundhead. Um, it simply wasn't as clear-cut as that. And it would have been a very limited definition of democracy. It wouldn't yeah, fit there's a modern no, definition. It's not democracy as we know it. And I was going to say, I, it's, not, it's not the people. A lot of mm. the people really were unaware of what was going on. 1644, so you're two years in to this war, and two great armies arrive to sort it out in the north of England at Marston Moor on a summer's day. And there's a sheep farmer there from Yorkshire, and he's got his sheep in the middle. And somebody goes over to him and says, you better move them along. The king and parliament are about to have a battle. And he goes, have they fallen out? <laughs> <laughs> so this is about the ruling classes sorting it out. It's you mean a, it's a fight within the ruling it's classes? It's within the ruling classes. And yes, they, as ever, called upon the ordinary man to come and fight for them and die for them. But they, apart from some really politicized and intelligent people in the New Model Army who debated the future of man, talked about universal suffrage, things that were really revolutionary, uh, these, were not, uh, these were not representative of the people as a whole. The people as a whole did what their masters told them, I'm afraid. OK, let's just hear this last one. There's going to be another round later, so don't worry, but this just, just now, yeah. You've kind of jumped the gun, but there were two things I really wanted to say. One was the bit about the elect. I always remember being astonished at school, and that team seems to me to be antithetical to a democracy, and actually that's one of the things that the Anglican Church had for it. And the other thing I was going to say, which you've just said, was the bit about the fact that ultimately Cromwell became Lord Protector, and that essentially you, you didn't end up with greater representation or for even for the small amount that was the gentry, and that seems to me to be their ultimate failing, that they weren't a very humane bunch, I guess. And just explain your problem with the notion of the elect, and perhaps explain that for people who are not um, steeped in this. Uh, as I understood it at, at school, was that there were a small group who were the elect, and regardless of what they did, um, my favourite were always the ranters, um, you, you were going to go to heaven, and yeah. that everybody else wasn't going to go, and it didn't really matter what you, what you did. So there was this, this one group that were chosen, if you like, and that everybody else... Um, depending on your, how your um, religion went, had to listen to them. And that's not very democratic and not very comforting either. Thank you. What I'm going to do now is ask our two speakers, just before you all vote, because we're getting to that point, crunch time, to do, deliver some sort of uh, closing summary, uh, summing up speeches, uh, just a couple of minutes each. And um, I think probably, Charles Winter, uh, you should uh, take on board that point that you just heard there. Um, why don't you go first? Two minutes. Uh, the case for why we should vote with you uh, as, as a roundhead and perhaps just, take, just include, if you would, that point about the elect and some rather sure. dodgy attitudes. Well, this is a time of great religious strangeness from our point of view. There were a lot of strange sects and a lot of strange beliefs, but they meant a lot to people, whether they were roundhead or cavalier. So I think um, it's impossible to apologize uh, for either side for their very strong religious beliefs. This was an age of superstition where religion got mucked up in that. But I would point out that it was Cromwell who welcomed back to this country people of Jewish faith. He accepted Quakerism, which had started uh, during the Civil War. And he was, apart from the Irish Catholics, which I have tried to explain, I don't excuse it, uh, a, a man of, of relative tolerance who uh, did actually a good job in teaching the Stuarts how to absorb other religions. But going back to my fundamental point about I'd rather be a roundhead than a cavalier, I take on board some very, very astute points from the audience. But I would say that the people who started off as roundheads morphed into the Whig party that gave 
further suffrage to the, the people of this country, more voting rights over the succeeding century and a half than anyone could have dreamt of uh, before the Civil War. These were people who put a, a price on merit over birth. And I know you're thinking that's hugely ironic that I say that, but it's true. This is a time when Pepys managed to win. Samuel Pepys in the Navy managed to win over Prince Rupert, who we've heard of from both sides, uh, the whole notion of how the navy of this country should be governed. Prince Rupert said, if a man's from the right family, he should be in charge of a ship. But Pepys managed to win in the 1670s. The fundamental basis for the professionalism of the navy that served this country so well for 300 years. And that was that nobody should even rise to the rank, uh, rank of lieutenant unless they passed, uh, first of all, having done three years, passed the requisite exams. And this was maybe health and safety gone mad, in Anna's view. But this actually led to a, a real professionalism and a talent in this country. And I think my final thought this evening was that when this motion was first thought of as one that uh, needed a, an airing tonight, I was asked to speak on behalf of the Cavaliers, and I couldn't think of a single reason to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. With, with her closing case for I'd rather be a cavalier, uh, two minutes to you, Anna White. I should say when I was asked to speak here, I wasn't given the choice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to pick up uh, Charles's comments about the kind of strange beliefs of the Puritans. I mean, I think perhaps that's slightly... Uh, patronising and dismissive of the beliefs of the, the Calvinists and so on who had this notion of the elect. And actually, you know, it wasn't just tied up in superstition. These were deeply held beliefs and actually key to understanding the debate at the time between the Roundheads and the Cavaliers. And as the lady absolutely said there, you know, when we are talking about Puritans who absolutely believe that some people are saved and some people are damned, um, it's very hard to really be talking about the good of the common man in the same breath. Um... <laughs> I, to, to finish, I guess, I would take a lot of the points, as Charles said, the, from, the, from the floor that have been spot on in many cases. And I think probably we can agree that actually we need to be a bit of both. And where we are now in terms of our constitutional monarchy is in many ways a bl successful blending of both particular sides. However, in terms of the actual motion, whether I'd rather be a roundhead and a cavalier, we can only be talking about where we are now. And in that sense, I think, whilst we can say that the cavaliers would represent a Britain of panache, pleasure, uh, individuality, a sense of living in the now and seizing the day, the roundheads would point to a Britain of discipline, of hard work, of state intervention, of doing the right thing. Uh, of following the letter of the health and safety uh, to, the, uh, to the limit. As I say, we actually want to be a blend of both, but I call on you to support the cause of the Cavaliers, as without it, what an impoverished, repressed, boring Britain we would be. <laughs> the English have always had an affection for wayward, idiosyncratic types, Nigel Farage aside, and long may that continue. So that's why I say I'd rather be a cavalier than a roundhead, and I reject the motion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It is... Uh, it's crunch time. Time for you to vote. People will be walking around with ballot boxes. You were given this <laughs> when you came here. You haven't finished yet. You will beat you. Oh, we have. Uh, <laughs> you were presented with these when you came in, your voting slip. Very, very simple, just uh, break it along the perforation. So a roundhead card goes in the box if you're voting uh, to be a roundhead and the cavalier to be a cavalier. If you don't know, stay sitting please. If you don't know and if you're, shh, if you want to abstain or you don't know, put the entire voting slip, both roundhead and cavalier, in the box if you are on that fence. Uh, between them. Uh, I'm just going to remind you of the vote when you came in. This is what it was like before you heard Charles and Anna debating. 33% of you exactly 
One third were roundheads, 38% of you, slightly more, were cavaliers, and 29% uh, were in the don't know category. Now you're voting. Uh, big solemn moment. We're going to try and count those as fast as we can. Uh, uh, but while we're doing that, we just thought we would take in a last few questions and contributions from the floor. You probably won't move many votes at this stage, but get something off your chest. We're going to bring it back here for responses. Let's try and do this uh, rapidly. There's a hand there. Let's, can we take a microphone to the gentleman there? The people holding the microphones may be collecting votes, but maybe not. Um, Let's hear from you. And I've got a question of my own for Charles, which I'll come to. Um, is there a hand here? Somebody here who would like to ask a question? Anyone up there? No. Well, let's hear from uh, you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for a, a great entertaining evening. I was um, now contemplating voting, and I'm uh, fearful I'm going to vote Cavalier and wake up the roundhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I, I totally subscribe to uh, being gay and being really enthused by uh, your, your uh, Cavalier arguments. Very nice, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else who wants to chip in, explain how they voted, why they voted? Uh, any questions they have still on their mind? The you ha the back, okay. There's a hand up there if we bring the microphone, and somebody up here, I'm told. That little boy had his hand up. Young man up there with the microphone, did you have your hand up, or were you just uh, no, expressing sheer enthusiasm for the evening? There's a hand there, yeah. Um, can we get a microphone to this chap here? While we're doing that, while we're waiting for the microphone, I'm going to put my question to you, Charles. Yes. Um, which was that, you know, as we've been describing, this side, the rounded side, were in a way the sort of proto-Republicans of their day. In fact, Republicans, because they formed a republic. And I'm just wondering, um, sort of any discomfort for you, given your background and uh, lineage being on that side of the argument, particularly because you will, and I'm taking you back to the events of 1997, there were many who felt there was a kind of Republican moment in this country, and that your speech, there, there were many people who said if that speech had been delivered three or four hundred years earlier, who knows what the consequences might have been. It may have made people turn against even this monarchy. And I just wonder if you have some of the scepticism you reserve towards the monarchy of the 17th century, whether some of that lives on, even applied to the monarchy in the 21st century. Well, I think 300 years earlier, I wouldn't be here tonight. So... Um, but the, the point being that the, the, there wasn't really, it wasn't so much Republican. Do you know, when, when the Roundheads went into battle to start with, it's, it's extraordinary to think they did it in the name of Parliament and the King. They thought they were going to win the battle and rescue the King from bad advisers. So they didn't start off as, Republican, as Republicans. And in fact, I think it was only a real hardcore who thought we should do without a King. Um, and in fact, you look at Cromwell himself he very seriously contemplated taking the throne. And I think it was with a view to securing a succession after himself. But his own comrades, the ones really at the core, thought it was from self-aggrandizement. And they said, don't do it. We've got rid of one tyrant and we'll get rid of another. So I don't think it was really a Republican um, debate. Uh, it became one that cost the, the head of a king. Um, uh, but. Uh, with, with huge politeness, I'm going to skip the rest of your question. And, 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 <laughs> and I'm just going to give one last little push, which I'll, and I'll accept being pushed back. But there, there, you know, there was a feeling here, now it seems bizarre, but for that week, that as if the monarchy was hanging by a thread, serious people thought that and said so, and that your very, very powerful oration seemed to be perhaps what could have been the last cut, you know, severing of that thread. Was any of that in your mind at the time? Well, I'm sorry, Jonathan, but my main attack was on the press. <laughs> and, um, it, and, and the bits about the monarchy were very much sort of add-ons. And if you look at that speech, there's very little about the, the, the um, monarchy itself. In fact, I, I think I even said we've, I fully respect the tradition mm. that they come from. So it wasn't, it wasn't this great anti-monarchical thing. It was very much a, a bashing of the press because my sister wasn't there to speak for herself and I thought it a duty to speak for her. And actually, particularly because I've been left as guardian of William and Harry, uh, I thought I should sort of say something to try and protect them from not your end of the press, but the stuff that's been uh, tickled by the Levinson inquiry. Mm. And it was and remains one of the most powerful speeches probably anybody here has heard in their lifetime. Well, that's very kind of you. But it, I mean, I, it's one I'd rather not have given. Of course. <laughs> Can I, I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I was just, I mean, I would say, I mean, not... I mean, in a way, I think, you know, Charles's speech was powerful, but for the, the, it, the emotion and obviously yeah. he, the context in terms of his sister. But I do think that, that the whole 
bigger circumstances around that moment was, was quite profound. And I think it wasn't about necessarily people wanting to get rid of the monarchy at that point, but I do think there was a moment of acknowledging uh, that the style of the monarchy needed to change. And there it was the sort of beginning of, a, of the monarchy turning out and engaging more with people, um, becoming more um, sensitive to... Uh, PR, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was watching the film The Queen, with you know, that Helen Mirren s s uh, starred in uh, just recently, and, and it kind of reminded me again of, of the sort of, you know, when the Queen was in Balmoral and didn't come down to London, and this kind of real rising uh, tensions in London and people gathering at the gates of the palace and when's she going to come back and when she and the fact that she didn't want to say anything um, and so on and so on. In the end, she was forced to make a kind of an address and cert or certainly that's how the film portrayed it. You know, it might, be, it might not be an accurate portrayal. So I think it really did sort of mark the beginning of a change in presentation, a gradual sort of the, the way in which the monarchy conveyed itself, the way that it articulates itself. It uses to use, you know, Twitter to be more outward facing, to yes. acknowledge that it needs to kind of be aware of popular opinion rather than simply disregard it if it's going to sort of endure and survive. So I do think it was a kind of watershed moment, not for Charles's speech in a sort of bigger picture, but I do think in that sense of needing to reconnect and, 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 see to, and be seen to respond to yes. the people at large. A and I suppose the point connecting to this subject tonight is that it shows these things are never fully settled. They're always contested, even three or four centuries later. I, I think so. I must tell you, my, my remembering of the, 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 the movie, the, spe the, the, the Queen, was I got a letter out of the blue, and it was from a production company, Granada or whatever, and they said they were going to, uh, could they use um, extracts from my speech uh, in something they were making? And I thought, oh, that's nice. It'll be on a late night program in, in Liverpool and Manchester. And I hadn't really looked at the whole thing. And I said, yes, that's fine. Um, would it be all right if you made a donation to a charity of my choice? I got a letter back saying, well, what would you like? And I thought, oh, well, maybe it'll get repeated. So I said, uh, would 500 pounds be all right? And of course, it was the whole movie, The Queen, oh. that was being made by Granada, and I didn't realize that. <laughs> but going back to your fundamental point, uh, my charity wasn't thrilled, I don't think. <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, but basically, I think that the, the point uh, which you're going against is that the monarchy, apart from those 11 years, has been the backdrop to this na nation's story. And therefore, it is uh, always in some sort of Vision. But as I say, you know, I think it's, it's reached this state now where um, it, uh, it is, if you look at these opinion polls, extremely popular what's come out of this. And the Civil War and 1688 and all that were little blips along the way. But we got something out of our system, I think, in the 17th century, which most European countries didn't. And we all know, of course, the French Revolution. But across Europe in the 1840s were really massive revolutions, and we didn't have that. And I think it's because we had sort of got a valve in place after the events which we've been debating tonight. There are some people who think that was, in a way, uh, not, not quite a tragedy, but a missed opportunity for Britain, because we had, full, as exactly as Charles says, we'd avoided a violent revolution in the 17th century. It meant we didn't have, for example, the revolution that the Americans would have a century later, where they went for a full democratic settlement. I mean, it wasn't fully universal suffrage, but you know what I mean. And that in some ways, these events act, did act exactly as Charles says, as a valve, but not in a good way. Yeah, I mean, certainly some would argue that it sort of lanced a boil, but, you know, the boil remained. Um, I'm not, is that the right kind of um, metaphor? I'm not sure it doesn't seem a very nice one. We got um, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the sense that there was a kind of... Uh, um, people were fearful of full-scale revolution um, and, and it sort of built in a sense of conservatism, I suppose, towards the established institutions. And, you know, that was a very qualified revolution as such. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think you can argue that it lanced the ball, but certainly, you know, Republicans, and as Charles said, you know, now, you know, that uh, percentage of the population is shrinking in recent years, but certainly they would argue that, yes, I mean, you know, that was the worst thing that could possibly have happened, in a way, the execution of Charles I, and because, you know, it simply meant that when we saw, or certainly the events that followed, because um, there was no prospect for a kind of uh, French Revolution-style mm. uh, revolt that f would lead to the abolition of the monarchy. The, the results are just seconds away. Um, I want to see if there's anybody else here who had their hand up and wanted to make a contribution. Yes, you were waiting patiently, yeah. I was going to ask, um, 
a lot of the things have been brought up about the divine right of the king or, or queen. Um, surely with the <clears throat> execution of Mary by Elizabeth I, and then later on the execution of Charles I, removes the idea of divine right, because it brought up an idea of a prince of Europe can be killed, therefore saying that they're no longer, they're just as mortal as the rest of us. In other words, so you think the right had already lapsed, as it were, by the time we get to this period? Yes, and why was that such a, an issue with this particular, it's already been, it's already been done 100 years yeah. ago. Charles Spencer, do you want to react to that? Well, yes. I mean, Mary Queen of Scots was executed, um, I, I think, basically, because she kept plotting. So uh, she, she was uh, a long-term prisoner who really overdid it, and Elizabeth reluctantly had her executed. And it, yes, that was... I mean, if you, it was so dramatic, the killing of this queen, that it was one of the prime reasons between the next year, the Spanish Armada coming... So these things didn't happen lightly, you know. I mean, we can look back in history and say, well, that one lost their head and that one did. But at the time, they were moments of such extraordinary uh, disbelief. You know, I have this theory on Charles I's execution that most of the people who turned up that day, knowing the king was going to be executed, didn't believe it would actually happen. Somehow it wouldn't happen. And even the people who had condemned him to death had taken the precaution of, ne of putting these four massive pins in the scaffold, because they thought that if it came to it, they would have to tie up Charles I and force him to die, because they couldn't believe they'd actually got to where they wanted to get to. And Pepys wrote about the gasp from the crowd when the axe fell and the king's head was held up. People were absolutely stunned. And then, I suppose, in the final sort of approval of the divine right of kings, a lot of the crowd rushed forward at Charles's execution to dip their handkerchiefs and clothing in the royal blood, believing it had magical mm. divine properties. And he became a martyr absolutely the instance that he died, didn't he? Mm. So in that sense, it sort of continued. Very last contribution from you, and then we're going to give the vote. Um, may I just simply give a plug? The, many of the issues which Charles has outlined are gloriously exemplified in the Putney debates. May I give a plug to my local church, uh, St Mary's Putney, which <laughs> has got a gorgeous little section with, uh, with recordings and descriptions of the Putney debates. And if you haven't experienced it, you've missed one of the greatest circumstances of English history. Quite right. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Very worthwhile plug. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we, we, we do now have uh, those results in. So before you came in, a third of you, 33% were roundheads, 38 Cavaliers, 29% don't know. The don't knows have now fallen to just 1%. So you may, did make up your minds. Uh, Cavaliers are 37%. Roundheads are 62%. A swing of 15%. It, me it means, as far as this house is concerned, you would all rather be... Uh, cavaliers than... Oh, let me have a look here. Sorry. Let me just throw it in. <laughs> Sorry, you would rather be roundheads than cavaliers by 62% to 37%. 62% 32%, 37%. The final result. It remains to thank our two speakers, Charles Spencer <laughs> and Anna Whitelock. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>